First of all, before we get started uh, with today's word, I, uh, a couple of things. First of all, it's great to be with Ralph and Christine in Switzerland literally just a few days ago now. I mean, it's not very long ago. I'm I should be seriously jet lagged, but I'm not at the I moment. We'll see. We'll see what it's like in a few hours from now. Don't fall um, now. <laughs> although I have been getting up significantly earlier than normal. The second thing is we've decided, Christina and I, that maybe the real gospel message is not what we think it is. What, it, what we think has happened is when Jesus died, he was sent to LAX. Oh, no. <laughs> to wander and go through customs and pick up baggage forever, it seemed like. And to drive around trying to find, because we, we decided if there was a hell, you got sent to LAX. That was, that was it. Let me tell you, it was intense. <laughs> Um, it was it was probably the most truly we uh, how many times we've traveled over the years but this one was like holy lord my gosh yeah the resurrection is real <laughs> we're back <laughs> so what I felt like when PK asked me to speak today was this title the renovated mind, grasping the consequence of the resurrection of Christ in our thinking. I mentioned this before, but before we start, I think it would be worth mentioning again. So let's just pray and then get into this. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. God, my prayer today is that we just lay aside all preconceived ideas, st some stuff that's been around for decades and even a few centuries that we may penetrate right into the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ today. God, I thank you. We have ears to hear, hearts to receive, eyes to see, and minds to perceive. In Jesus' name. But truly, we have to let some things go sometimes in order to open to a greater understanding of you. May we do so today in Jesus' name. I think it would be worth mentioning that with the, resurre with the resurrection, without it, Jesus is just another religious zealot who died for his cause. While that's noble, important, and meaningful, the death of Jesus doesn't have the same impact without the resurrection. However, just the death and resurrection of Jesus at the time of those events and how they come to us today also may not be enough. Now, what I want to do today is, you know, sometimes you, you gently share things, but I figure I've, in this maybe 30, 45 minutes, and if it's Master Giovanni time, that'll be two hours later. Um, of course, there's no time or distance in the spirit, so surely you won't be bored. It's good to see you, Lou. Um, I just, I felt like, you know what, today maybe just needs to be an icebreaker day. Just being an icebreaker or, or a plow, just just burrow through to make a point. I use the term renovate rather than resurrect for the mind because according to several thesauruses, Merriam-Webster, the power of thesaurus, classic thesauruses, Shandara Basata, right? <laughs> Say thesaurus five times and you'll start speaking in tongues. Yep. Um, and a few more. All connect the word resurrect to renovate. While in simple terms, when we think of resurrection, we think of a dead body coming back to life, which is totally accurate as a definition. But my word to you today is to say that there's something far more reaching. For one, renovating your thinking means to rise or climb out of the death-like thinking and emerge into the living reality of Christ and who we are as a result. A good friend of mine, Giles Parker, you know him, yeah. he's spoken here several times, mm -hmm. said this, many times people prefer a confident lie than a hesitant truth. Mm -hmm. wow. Yep. Wow. Again, many times people prefer a confident lie than an, a hesitant truth. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not limited to spirituality, but to other areas of life as well. But most importantly, those who claim they understand spiritual things, this is important, I think. 
Because many times the confident lie seems so much like the truth. For example, if the physical death of Jesus and the bodily resurrection was simply about an angry ruling God, the father, the killing of his son or a lesser God for humanity's sin and its defense, his subsequent death, and despite such a brutal death coming back to life, then throughout history, there are a lot of other gods we can put our faith in. I think that's sometimes just the, the challenge for some of us in modern day. We don't realize the consequence of these ideas. For example, 800 years before Jesus, the mythology of Prometheus was put forth. He is a Titan God who was given the task of creating humanity. When he did, he created them in the image of the gods. Zeus was outraged by humanity being in his image, especially because of their imperfections, and it was now going to destroy them. Zeus and that outrage and his affliction toward humanity, Prometheus stepped in, filled with compassion for mankind, and brought them fire to withstand the wrath of God. Even more enraged by Prometheus' compassion, Zeus had Prometheus captured, chained in cruciform wow. on the rocks of Scythia, where eagles were given the task to pierce his side wow. and eat his liver in torturous death. Why the liver? The Greeks believed that the liver was the seat of the soul. However, after killing and eating Prometheus' liver, the liver would regenerate it and Prometheus would come back to life again. This happened over and over until Zeus was satisfied by some other series of events, but let's not stop there. So we have Prometheus, which is about 800 BC. Let's go back way further to Osiris, 2400 BC in the Old Kingdom. Like Prometheus, who was a god who was killed by a wrathful god and came back to life again, when we go back to Osiris in 2400 BC, we see a similar myth portrayed. Osiris was murdered by his brother god and then came back to life, was resurrected and called Horus, which was the designation of the god as king of kings. Mm, wow. <laughs> okay with healing protection and the proclamation of the Lord of heaven and earth. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. First thing what it may be doing by even starting to share about this is our ego gets involved because we thought we were special. Because mm -hmm. we know the truth. Hold on. I want you to process this because this is not something new I'm sharing with you. This is thousands of years old. This is nothing new. We don't share it much. And then, of course, in our minds, but yeah, but, we go, yeah, but, but, yeah, but, wait a minute, before the year, but. <laughs> the mythology continues to resurface in the Egyptian New Kingdom. Matter of fact, several times in between. But when we read 1500 BC, it's also associated with this point called a hyalical rising called Sirius. Everybody hear Sirius radio? That's what the idea comes from. Sirius spelt the same way. It's a rising star in the east, which the ancient Egyptians called Sopdet, who was also personified as a goddess earlier on. So now... Osiris, with his resurrection and all these ideas, is now associated with the star that rises. Now, in his case, it's once a year. Then, not good enough, Osiris in that story is rekindled with the Bibliotheca Historica in 50 BC by a fellow by the name of Dorodorius Cilicius. And that was between actually 50 and 30 BC. I just put 50 there just to keep the numbers kind of simple. And there are several others. In the ancient Babylon, it was Ishtar and Tammuz, as well as in Persia, the Mithras cults. And probably one of the most famous of the Greek world is this name, Dionysius, which is about 1300 BC. 
Dionysus, who was half God, half man, sound familiar? Whose father God impregnated a mortal woman who subsequently gave birth. Dionysus was the God man who gave wine, who had to endure great suffering and death at the hand of the angry gods, whose heart was then ingested by his father and kept in his thigh. Good, interesting correlation is Revelation 19:16, where his name is on the thigh, the word of God then resurrected and becomes the God of resurrection and rebirth. Have I, have I concerned you yet? <laughs> He's then taken by the Romans and given another name, Bacchus. Bacchus, who, when they partook of wine during his worship, okay, danced in worship, and they believed that God would come and inhabit them as they worshiped. Observers would call them insane because such worship created shouting, spinning, and even for some, a passing out. Sounds like a re Pentecostal revival right there. Now, on the right, if you can see that, probably better on camera. On the right is what's known as the Talisman of Orsia, Orpheus Bacchus. It was in the Museum of Berlin and was lost during the Second World War, but its casting remained. It was dated prior to the Council of Nicaea, and depending upon who you read, there are different stories as to why it existed specifically with the name, which is actually there um, on its actual thing. If you notice, though, here's the thing. How does Bacchus or Dionysus die also in cruciform? Wow. So hear me clearly. My point isn't an attempt to reduce the death and resurrection of Jesus. But to point out, if that's all there is, the notion of a God who died and rises again was nothing new to the cultures of the day. You could say that if you were in the time of the apostles and walked through the East or the West and talked about a God, half man, half God, who was killed by a God of wrath, suffered death and rose again from the dead and would rule the heavens, it would be nothing new. It wasn't that the message was hard to believe, but that it wasn't uncommon. Thus, if you told people about a son of a God who died and rose again, many would say, so we've been hearing that for centuries. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. An important point made some years ago in a message I shared was that Jesus' disciples didn't follow him because they knew he was going to die on a cross, raise from the dead, and ascend to heaven. They were clueless about that at the time. They followed him because of the content of his message. Which is why, interestingly enough, in the West, Jesus is more known as Savior, where in the East, he's more known as Wisdom. We know this because the onlookers were moved by miracles, but the disciples were touched by the power of his words. His message about God the Father was different than other existing myths, including the mixed message of a depiction of the God of the Torah. Now, the amalgamation of these myths together for the sake of time as we think of them in both East and West, as the Apostle Paul and others brought the message, many times the context, which I've been trying to get across to us for a while, and many others, which is, to me, I want to talk about a, um, God doing a work around the, the world, really, uh, like in meeting with Ralph in, in, in Switzerland, or, or Andreas in, in Leipzig, or Francois in South Africa, and just there are people that are coming alive to the fact that the message of the gospel has become something else, and we're now going back to its original core. Yes. Yeah. 
In all these myths, we find an angry ruling god or gods who require vengeance for a misdeed or a sin, even a fear of their throne being threatened from a son, from another god, usually half man, half god, this lesser god, god man, usually becomes the sacrifice which appeases the gods of wrath, but eventually rises from the dead in some form of victory. This is why believing that Jesus was put on a cross to pay for God's wrath against humanity is truly a pagan story. And not the gospel of the New Testament. Hence, a confident lie that doesn't require complete renovation or renewing of the mind because it's happy to stick with it. And it's easy to stick with the status quo. We just, in a sense, have the same paganistic ideas with a Jesus t-shirt. And it's convincing. Now, it doesn't mean God doesn't meet us and touch us, etc., because he's of a different mindset than we are. So consider what we, in the name of the so-called good news, have chosen to believe. God's wrath was satisfied, satisfied in Christ alone. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus to atone for the sin of those who believe and trust in him. Jesus suffered God's wrath in your place. None of this is New Testament. No. No. That's your pagan deities rekindled. The key is, though, worse yet... As I want you to note the two pictures, by the way, I just, all I did was a fast scan <laughs> on the internet. Right at the top are these two. Right. Jesus suffered God's wrath in your place, as if we are now going to put the Father against the Son within the Trinity. The Trinity never opposes itself. But. Notice the red fiery background. Notice the flaming cross over here. The thing that really struck me was worse, worse than what those two pictures represent with flames and a red glowing background. I want to show you something else with this mindset. This is where it kind of gets a little hardcore. I'm about to show you a picture of what I would call an extreme but the belief system of a God angry at sin, willing to destroy human beings and throw them into eternal hell, promotes this kind of thinking. Mm. Yeah. Of course they do. The Klan. Of course they do. Now you say, well, that's crazy. Well, I don't believe that. Okay, fine. Now, this particular cut I'm going to show, list, let you listen to. I'm not mentioning names because I don't care about names. But I do want to say this. This was a particular conference that happened just a few years ago. Uh, you can see the video in its entirety. I'm not interested in showing you names, but I will say this. This fellow who's speaking right now was the head of the conference and invited speakers to it. This fellow who believes in that kind of God and calls it the gospel of Jesus Christ, says some pretty horrific things. I'm just going to show you a small segment. What's really bad is it's not just 10 people there, 20 people, 100, 500, 1,000 people that's at this conference. Not only has he been publicized and written material saying these kind of things, what was really scary was the Christians he invited to speak with him. If I gave you their names, you'd be horrified. Not to mention state senators and governors who were speakers at the conference, didn't just attend. And at the end of, for example, of this video, one of those wonderful senators getting up and shaking his hand. Listen to his words. Yes, Leviticus 2013 calls for the death penalty for homosexuals. Yes, Romans chapter 1, verse 32, the Apostle Paul does say that homosexuals are worthy of death. His words, not mine. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am not ashamed of the truth of the word of God. And I am willing to go to jail for standing on the truth of the word of God. And I know so. What's really scary is that there was a whole crowd of people applauding this. And the thing is, is this is real. 
what's happening in our time. With government leaders, et cetera, shaking their hands at this. Now, what's my point? First of all, I do not in the least believe that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though he's using Leviticus and Romans in completely out of context of what they mean. Yet, here's the catch. If you believe in a wrathful God that comes against sin and sinners and wants to throw them in eternal conscious torment forever and ever, this becomes okay. I'm going to go back to the uh, slides. Point is, is when that mindset is okay, you believe we then start to believe it's okay to do certain things and say certain things. Now, my focus really is not this, but I, when I got to this point in the message, I thought, you know what? We need to make it real. The fact that there are people who are applauding in the name of so-called Jesus, calling this the gospel, the fact that we have leaders in certain particular uh, parties, et cetera, et cetera, that are applauding this and shaking hands at this, I'm sorry, this is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, the notion he drank the cup of God's wrath for our sins, and they quote Matthew 26, 42, which doesn't even say God was wrathful. We even get a scripture like this, pull it out of context to support this view of God. However, the verse doesn't say anything about God being enraged by humanity that he's going to destroy them and throw them in hell forever. Now, if you've been around us a long time, you know we've done the work, the Hebrew, the Greek, etc., to bring this out and even show you where translations, I'll show you one briefly, that inserts something that's not there and changes the whole context. Rather, both Jesus and her, his father are aware of what will be forthcoming as he continues to be in this all-inclusive God of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. The cross was inevitable. Knowing full well that this is going to have to be the cup that they will endure. Father, Son, Spirit are willing to hold true to their identity and ours as his creation, as the image and likeness of God. The wonderful author, Brian Zan, uh, who is a friend of a friend of mine, recently posted this on Monday, Thursday regarding the Easter celebration. I thought this really said it so well. The cross is not what the Father inflicts upon the Son in order to forgive the world. The cross is what God in Christ endures as he forgives the world. The New Testament is very clear. Acts 2, 22 through 25. Israelite men, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man validated by God among you by feats of power and prodigies and signs that God performed in your midst through him, as you yourselves know. This man delivered up by the predetermined counsel with the foreknowledge of God. They knew exactly what they were getting into for us. You killed. Didn't say God killed. You killed, affixing him with nails, notice the underline, employing the hands of men without the law. Isn't that what religious people do? Get the other folks to do it and say, hey, I'm good. I'm good. Him whom God raised up. Now we see the difference. You killed him. God raised him up. Yeah releasing him from the torments of death because it was not possible for him to be restrained by it. Acts 3, 12 through 16. This is the New American Standard updated edition. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate. Notice the word disowned. in the presence of Pilate when he had deci decided to release him. Can you imagine that? The secular government was ready to let him go. Religious people didn't. That's right. 
but you, again, disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Boy, does that sound similar right now. But you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Now, before you, that's why before sometimes, you know, we need to do our hermeneutics a little bit because before we then start reading these other texts in the epistles where we have no frame mm -hmm. and we start assuming God's really angry at mankind. Jesus steps in to be, be bit up by his father, mm -hmm. you know, that whole thing. We're, we're missing the point. But unfortunately, because that teaching has been around for about 500 years, a la John Calvin. We just, this is reality. This is because every, everywhere you turn, this is where it is. But no, it's not. Church history won't let you stay there. Continue. Acts 4.10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, Notice the correlation. Acts 5, 29, 31. We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. Matthew 27, 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. Persu how, uh, how are we being persuaded right now? to put the living Christ within us to death for a false Christ. How about this in Romans? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath. And I have an italics and gray of God there because it's put in that this was the wrath of God. But it's not so in the text. We already know. We just read all those scriptures whose wrath it was. Right. And on top of it, when you read Romans, you have to you begin to realize, again, hermeneutically speaking, you begin to realize what wrath is because of the teaching of the wrath of the gods. Mm. So, so it's funny. God demonstrates his own love. But if then if you're going to interpre interpolate to it, interpolate, that's a word, right? No, no idea. <clears throat> but God demonstrates his own love toward us that we'll be saved from his own wrath. What? <laughs> the phrase saved from the wrath, really not of God, is twofold. First, it's being saved from the wrath of the gods or the inferred singular, as in Ephesians, also written by Paul, whose wiles and fiery arrows are thrown against us in our minds. New believers in that message at that time were frightened by betraying their pagan gods to now worship this new god. Mind you, the pagan gods were substitutionary gods. Okay? Okay. How many times have we heard some in different places? Well, the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus, not. The theological name is penal substitution and vicarious atonement theory. Interesting study. They were frightened by betraying their pagan substitutionary gods for a God of reconciliation, inclusion through love, grace, and acceptance would harm them. Consider, we are talking about a pagan ritual God who dials at the violent hand of a judgmental ruling God or gods in contrast to a God who dies and forgives our violence against him. Big difference. Thus, through genuine faith and trust, we receive acceptance and grace, not through any other means, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. So we put on the helmet of salvation, as it says in Ephesians 
6.17, the thinking of true salvation. This is where, the, if you want to call it warfare, the war really is. The egoistic, fleshly, carnal, paganistic, whatever else you want to call it, mind, easily accepts the egoistic, satanic thinking of an angry God against mankind who demands a sacrifice or else there's death and the eternal conscious torment of a fiery hell waiting. This is also called by Paul, quote, the God of this world. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But not the God and Father of Jesus Christ, who is his Father and our true Father. Rather, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 9, now all these things are from God, who, what? Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, now listen, that God was in Christ yes. reconciling the world to himself. Yes. God was not opposed to Christ at the cross. Not counting their trespasses against them. Let me go back and reread that segment there. That God who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Your trespasses are forgiven. God the Father was in Christ, not wrathfully placing judgment upon him for us, but reconciling the entire cosmos to himself, not counting our trespasses or sins against us. Though we violently crucified God, who is Christ, think of it. We attempted to kill God. Exactly. That's a very good point. Pastor Karen just said, yeah. And then we flip and try to claim that he was trying to kill us. And Jesus kind of steps in and goes, no, 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 don't do it. You know, <laughs> I'll take the beating from my fa my abusive father. You know, I'll, no, I'll do that. No, no, no. Let me add to this thought. It is clear in the book of Acts, if we're going to do proper hermeneutics, let alone in other New Testament scriptures, that we, mankind, crucified Christ, who is the incarnation of God, Jesus being the incarnation of God. You may think, well, I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, so I wouldn't have done it. Oh, wow. Really? Understand something. The betrayal and crucifixion of the incarnate God-man Jesus didn't just happen. Rather, it was first conceived in the heart before it was executed in the world. To this day, when we deny our divine identity as the image and likeness of God, we, in effect, crucify the living Christ within us. Yes. Wow. Yes. For the sake of reminiscing, Genesis chapter 3. The man and the woman are already the image and likeness of God. They were made that way. They didn't have to do anything to become it. They were made that way. And then they come across the serpent in the tree. And the serpent says, can't you eat of all the trees in the garden? The woman says, yes. She goes, well, great. How about this one? The woman says, no, we're not supposed to do that. Now, we, I'm not going to do the whole Genesis factor teaching right now, 10 hours later, on um, what all this is. I'm just barreling through it. But the point is, the point is, at that point, the serpent says, Genesis 3, 5, but God knows that if you eat of this tree, you will know good and evil and will become like God thought they were already like God, but they bit the lie. They were not like God enough. They needed something more. And what did they need? The knowing of good and evil. Now, if you think about it, our entire world is based on right and wrong, good and evil. Hello, serpent. The Christ operates in a completely different system. It's called the tree of life. The tree of death is the tree of good and evil and its knowledge. 
So you need to tell me you got to let go. To a point, yeah. To a point we got the let our egoistic self-centeredness to let go of what we even think the Bible says is good and evil and become like Christ. Amen. This is why on the cross, which we probably have heard sermons throughout this week on, maybe these paradoxical kind of juxtaposition sermons, because when... We were crucifying Christ, if you will. He was saying, you're forgiven. Yeah. He didn't say, well, we'll get to that in a second. We'll, we'll go there. When you believe the serpentine egoistic words, you're not like God enough until you eat of the tree that knows good from evil, which brought death to us all. And I'm talking in the spiritual sense. And may I add to it what others may say as they preach, not just physical death. It's as if that's the real issue, like physical death is the real problem here. Did you know if you go back through Jewish history, you go back through all these other religious systems, physical death was not as big of an issue as we make it? The real issue is the death of the reality of our identity in Christ. Many of us live a death life, a life absent from our true identity as God made us. Not simply saying we're all God's children is good enough. That's a nice adage. But the true knowing that we are the exact image and replication of the Father himself when we commit acts of violence against other human beings, whether they're conscious or unconscious of their divine identity or not, so irrelevant, to put it bluntly, as Jesus says, if you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Matthew 25, 40. This is a key aspect of the consequence of the resurrection of Christ in our thinking. You can't have a God of love and a God of violence at the same time. What are we doing? That's a, that dualistic tree. You know, it maybe helped you get in the door because that's what we knew. But that's not the doorway that's going to keep us alive and going forward in Christ. The picture on the screen means to see with our true Christ-centered eyes, a renovated mind. When we realize the meaning of the resurrection of Christ, we will allow our thinking to be renovated. We no longer see an angry God who demands payment for our sins. Say, well, but doesn't the Bible say, consider who's he talking to? Their mindsets. We no longer see an angry God who demands payment for our sins, one who claims to love us and yet demands our death to satisfy a bloodlust followed by tormenting us for eternity if we don't love him back. When you think of it, such a God is more immoral with such a behavior and demand than the immorality he claims to punish by doing that. Really? Read it. Deuteronomy 12, 31, 2 Kings 17, 17, Jeremiah 19, 5 through 6, and Jeremiah 32, 35. That's an immoral God. And I don't care if we put a Jesus t-shirt on him. This fabricated God, like all the other pagan gods we, we devised, one made with our egoistic image, we need to put aside. God, the father of Jesus, throughout the ages, maybe through such myths and stories, told of one who would be willing to die because he loved, like Prometheus, who desired to help mankind against a wrathful God. In Gnosticism, for example, it proclaims that a demiurge, in other words, a demigod, Yaldabaoth to be specific, created this world and all the violence in it. Like the other myths I mentioned at the beginning, this Gnostic tale isn't that far off. The difference is we are the demiurge. We created this world of violence and death. 
We are the demigod responsible for the egoistic, self-serving wrath against each other, and for that matter, the true God. However, if this is going to work for Easter, then may this be the message. The message of the incarnate Christ brings truth into focus. God was never angry at man for sin, nor was he vengeful, vengeful requiring payment for our failures in a bloodlust in order to so-called forgive. Let's settle something here. Paying for a debt isn't forgiveness. It's a debt paid. Even if that same God through himself pays it, which is a real misconception, that totally doesn't make sense, but it's amazing what Kool-Aid we drink. This should make us cringe, but rather it caters to our egoistic system. Consider, you owe a bank money, okay? And the owner of the bank supposedly is going to forgive you the debt, but what we claim he does because you owe him, he takes out a loan from his own bank to pay back himself. Yet, outside of a renovated mind in the resurrected Christ, that somehow makes sense. Of course it does. Because we're the demiurge that lives in a justice system of debt and payment, not love, grace, and forgiveness and acceptance. Add to that, on top of it, then you have to make a choice regarding the banker you owe that took out a loan to pay back himself that if you don't make that choice, that banker is not going to just simply demand payment back. He's going to cast you in a prison that you'll be tormented forever in. That's like being put into an electric chair and being electrocuted forever and not dying. Crazy. Believe it to us to conceive of such things. No, we don't honor the father of Jesus with that. Actually, that thinking is Moloch, Hadad, Baal, Satan, devil, God of Tophet, and ultimately an antichrist. However, what really happens is God comes to humanity in a form they can understand, human form. It's called the incarnation. Jesus and says, you are my very image and likeness. You're a replica of me. I made you that way and I love you that way. So far, so good, right? But sadly, the ego not only can live with that idea, it kind of likes the notion. Yeah, I'm, I'm like God. Man, man, I am a God. Well, that's fine, but the ego, which is the opposite quality of true God, can't embrace that in reality. But then Jesus adds this, my paraphrase, I love you and forgive you of any debt to me or any other God you devised. No payment necessary. You're absolved. Then what we respond is, how dare you mess with my, my egoistic justice system of good and evil? And then beat him and crucified him. Why? Because if the God of the universe is loving, forgiving, and gracious, and I'm in his image, then I got to be like that too. And that takes real faith. That takes real trust. Pardon the egoistic pun, but hell no. But it didn't stop there. Then we thought a God of greasy, graced, wishy-washy justice, inclusive rather than holy and separate, is not strong and mighty like a lion, but a wimpy like a little lamb. So we crucified that idea, silenced it. We buried that foolishness once and for all. 
Then comes the other part of the dying and rising God story, but this one is real and different. Jesus is raised from the dead. Keep in mind that the egoistic justice system we created just killed an innocent man who claimed only to love and offer his divine life. Here's the new problem. Now he has every right in our legalistic system to judge, condemn, and execute us. But Jesus says, once again, my paraphrase, now listen, I wasn't kidding. I forgive you. And I say, peace be unto you. There is no war between us. There is only peace between us. No payment necessary. You are loosed, released from any sinful debt you may think or feel obligated to pay. Not because I paid it, but because I forgave it. And by the way, if in your mind it's not yet renovated to a place to grasp that, Jesus still speaking, if you can't understand the notion of an unpaid debt, just being forgiven and can't grasp the idea that my forgiveness is enough and it's worth way more than a payment. Let's try this. At this point, what Jesus starts telling us upends our egocentric justice system. But here's what the New Testament adds to help those of us with that mindset. The apostles continue to say things like, if Jesus was speaking, my paraphrase, If that's still a problem for you to comprehend, consider this. Because you contrived and worship gods and goddesses that require blood sacrifices for payment for sins, then take mine. Clearly, you shed my blood, which is my father's blood in my veins, through the cross. Which I willfully gave to make the point that I will not fight or destroy you even if I had the right in your legalistic system. At that point, maybe there would be a dramatic pause for an effect. He continues. So here it is. We, the Trinity, Father, Spirit, and Son, forgive you. We proclaim peace between us and you, even though you gave us the right to do otherwise in your justice system. But we are who we are. Grace and mercy is what we do. So, because we did not demand a sacrifice for payment in order for forgiveness to happen, like the pagan gods you created, we understand that maybe you can't wrap your mind around that. So technically, you have my father's blood on your hands. So use that to satisfy any bloodlust you may have. We were willing to shed our blood to prove our love. The point is, you're powerless here. Think of it. Forgiveness is done, and you won't change our mind toward you at all. No blood payment was necessary to my father, but if you need one in your pagan way of thinking, then I shed it and paid it, and you can't undo it. There's no way out. Either you realize you are our love, our desire, our forgiveness, our acceptance, or you don't. But whether you do or don't doesn't change our opinion of you for ages upon ages. Let's conclude with a little more of Jesus' words without reading the entire sections mentioned, but you'll know these, I'm sure, when I get to them. So just listen to what Jesus says. Consider Jesus, who is God incarnate, teaching in Luke 15. In the story of the lost sheep, did the shepherd wait for the sheep to realize his lostness? Find the error of his way and make his way back to the shepherd? No. Did the woman who lost her precious coin wait for her coin to come to its senses? Yes, that's a joke. Think about it. Wait for the coin to come to its senses. Okay. Just being punny, right? So did the woman who lost her her coin, right, 
wait for her coin to come to its senses and realize its lostness and find its way back into her purse? No. Did the lost son who religiously comes to his senses, cha-ching, by feeling unworthy, clean himself up and ask his father for forgiveness and was happy to be a servant in his father's house? No. More importantly, did the father say, okay, now that you repented and realized how sinful you are, I'll let you be a servant in my house? No. Rather, in the first example, the shepherd left all and went after the sheep. It didn't matter if the lost sheep realized the error of its ways and figured out a way home. In the second example, the woman turned on a light, cleaned her whole house, and sought after the lost coin, which never lost its value regardless where it was. Thus, the whole notion of saying, God, I'm unworthy, is like, no. Irrespective if you may feel it, no. You're just as valuable, irrespective of the way you think you're, about yourself. Again, this is where real faith comes in, because that's hard for us to think that. In the third example, the loving father, at first sight of his son, ran to him, compassionately hugged him, did not acknowledge his son's groveling, and most definitely didn't agree with his son's so-called repentant self. But the father gave him new clothes, ones that reflected his son's true identity, nothing less, killed the fatted religious calf. No, that wasn't the sacrifice to save the son. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus was called the lamb, not a calf. However, without doing that whole teaching on the prodigal son, which we've done, it's online, the fatted calf is that calf. That was funny. You had to see it. Never mind. Um, the whole notion of killing, killing the fatted calf is actually killing the calf that Israel created and called Jehovah during the making of the Ten Commandments. We're going to get rid of that religious stuff. That's the stuff we're going to kill and eat. But the father gave him new clothes, recognized his identity, got rid of the religiosity and the old way of thinking, and then made a radical celebration in his house in which all were invited. Everybody was. The only person, the other prodigal son, who wasn't in the house, that was on the outside, that was angry and knew all the sins of his other brother, that didn't come in, was the religious guy. I've been serving all these years, like, well, you've been serving out there, you haven't been serving in here. And the father says, come in, begs him to come in. And sadly, the story ends with him still outside the house. You know why? I'm convinced, because we get to answer the question. The renovated mind grasps that the resurrection undoes everything that put Jesus on the cross. Whether you believe in the mythologies of the dying and rising gods, that a wrathful God or gods demanded payment for sin, whether you believe in the gods of sacrifice, who were not satisfied until they had their bloodlust uh, taken care of. Not to mention, adding to that, the eternal conscious torment, the flames forever and ever and ever. It's hard to believe that that teaching's only been around for about 1,500 years. For that matter, it doesn't matter where your thinking is as you stand before the cross, except for one thing. I mean, think about it. Whether we still have a mindset that my debt has to be paid because I'm that bad, Jesus is like, okay, done. Whether you stand in a bit more of a Christ-centered standpoint of saying, God's just forgiven me. There's no debt. Any debt that I owed, he's forgiven. He hasn't paid for it. He hasn't done it. He has embraced me that much. And then if I'm really kind of got to really re re consider people that you're talking to 2,000 years ago where blood sacrifices were still being practiced. Mm -hmm. 
not, I'm not talking just about Jewish people either. I'm talking about you know the cultures as well, all that. that and then the issue is, okay, if you can't wrap your mind around the fact that I just forgave you and that some bloodlust has to be satisfied and take my blood. The cross and everything in it is undone by the resurrection. There's only one thing that's not undone at the cross. One. It doesn't... Actually, well, let me rephrase that. It doesn't only leave something, it reinforces it. The absolute, non-retaliatory, non-retributive love of the eternal God and Father of us all. Loving us despite our arrogance, despite our accusation, despite our egoism, despite our violence, despite our sinfulness, despite our redefining as to why he was crucified, he continues to say, peace be to you. No war between us. Consider the words of Jesus as we backtrack for a minute. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, right? We all know that. Which again, something PK and I have talked about, it's kind of amusing because a lot of us would come forth first saying that there was a literal snake in the garden that talked or that, you know, certain angels came down from heaven, had sex with women that created giants, Genesis 6. We're so willing to believe that. But when Jesus says, love your enemies, now we need to qualify what political party they're in. Or we got to now qualify whether or not they have the same belief system as us. <laughs> What's really funny is the truth of the message of love your enemies. And I'm saying that to end with this point. Love your enemies, enemies means you don't have any. Irrespective of how they view you, you don't view them the same way. Hence, turn the other cheek concept. I'm not going to be your enemy. I'm not going to retaliate that way. You've been reconciled, whether you believe it or not. But believing it, realizing it, will renovate everything in your life and you will emerge from the darkness of death thinking into the reality of a true light of who you really are and who you and our, you and God are together. It's hard to believe that what I just shared with you today is consistent with the first 200 years of the church. We've done some extensive teaching here with dates, names, and people, and how things got changed to where we are today. But the gospel is, debt's canceled, you're forgiven, you're my image and likeness, whether you believe it or not. You've been redeemed, not because of anything you did or choices you made, but because of what I did. That takes faith. It really does. Because everything in our egoistic self says, nope, got to qualify it some way. I need to be involved somehow. But as the Apostle Paul says, it's by grace you're saved. Now, most of us think grace is unmerited favor. That's a wrong translation. We've been, it's maybe even been in our lexicons, but it's incorrect. Charisma, at the time of Plato, Aristotle, etc. That word was the word for pleasure. And matter of fact, I think is my point of view. You don't have to agree with it; just a thought. I think one of the reasons why the the apostles employed it is because it was so contrary to the Greek culture of its time. Because the Greek culture of its time believed that those kind of pleasures are what prevented you from having wisdom like sexual pleasures and other things like that. So they, they, they use that word to define such uh, low-level pl pleasures. But when you read it, when it's that kind of passionate pleasure, and you realize what that word is where it says, by charis, by that 
passionate, loving pleasure. It was God's passionate pleasure to save us. It's God's passionate pleasure to give us the kingdom. It's God's passionate pleasure to bestow his gifts upon us. The renovated mind grabs that. I'm going to challenge you to renovate your thinking. I know we have some work to do. I believe that's why a lot of the new translations that have been coming out in the last decade or so are really challenging the status quo, really addressing the syntax of the different Greek texts. It's hard to believe that we have diverse Greek texts too that we're having to weed through right now to do one specific thing, the Jesus hermeneutic. The Jesus hermeneutic. Before we do any other kind of hermeneutics or studies and texts, what's the Jesus hermeneutic? And you know what? You're not going to ultimately find that in a book, but in your heart. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for this Easter Sunday. I hope this made sense with the faux pas. And the Lord, I, I, that's, my prayer is this. The fact that Jesus was willing to die on a cross for the truth of his never changing love for even violent humanity call it sinful, call it whatever you want. Father, I pray that we would awaken to that ourselves, that we would die to our egoistic selves who, who become retributive, that feels like things have to pay and so-and-so needs to do this or so-and-so should have done that. But Father, I pray for a transformational revelation of the living Christ within us Jesus, the one who died and rose from the dead and ascended, living in us, that we become conscious of that. And rather than front-loading the message of forgiveness, we just forgive like he forgave. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Karen.